Hyperpigmentation is an interesting skin condition. You know, it seems very simple. We're talking about the melanocyte at the basal layer of the epidermis. And, you know, for many years I educated uh, in classrooms and talked about how the melanocyte was a, a, a monster. It became out of control and, and maybe even a genetic mutation that was creating uh, the changes in the melanocyte. Or on occasion I would talk about how melanocytes bunge in the skin and that creates an increase in the melanin production in one certain spot or many different spots on the face. But I sort of have a revamped, if you will, uh, philosophy at this point. Hyperpigmentation, quite simply, is an area in the skin that has been severely compromised. In other words, it's been scarred, damaged, to the point at which it can no longer provide adequate free radical support or adequate antioxidants in order to maintain that area. Now, what's nice about the melanocyte is it prote protects against aging, it protects against damage. I mean, they're, they're wonderful free radical squelchers, as I'll call them. And the body uses them on a day-to-day -day basis. Every time we go out in the sun, we create a certain level of free radicals. The skin responds by producing melanin. So, when every time that we interfere with melanin production, and this is an important thing to understand, every time that we interfere with melanin production, we are compromising the health of our skin. So when I tell you about how osmosis approaches this, I will tell you that this is the only time that osmosis actually works against what the skin is trying to do. Now let's step back for a second and remember that hyperpigmentation, while we think it's a melanocyte gone out of control, is most likely simply an area of the skin that required a melanocyte to protect it more than it was being protected by the free radical squelchers, the antioxidants that we normally provide. So on a general, any given day, we receive a certain amount of photo damage, um, free radical damage, like I said, from stress or diet. All of those things are occurring at the dermal and the epidermal level. And all of these things uh, would normally be handled well by a, a healthy, well-protected skin. But because we as a, have a tendency in America and other parts of the world to damage our epidermis on a daily basis, we're a little bit less protected. So that adds one layer to our skin's um, formation of hyperpigmented areas. The second layer is added when we go out and we have excessive exposure to sun. Let's say we get a really bad sunburn or we're out in the sun for two to three hours during uh, prime time and we know we're getting a lot of free radical activity. That will also compromise the skin. But at the end of the day, it's a buildup of scar tissue and a reduction of capillary flow. Once again, capillary flow is critical to the protection of the skin because it's the only way the antioxidants and the antioxidant cofactors, minerals and the like, are delivered to the skin. So when we have a diminishment in a specific area, and this is how I like to think of it, when you have a little round dot of hyperpigmentation, that is a deficiency in that area of antioxidants and protective enzymes and that results in an increase in melanin production because the skin says hey if I don't have enough antioxidants to help then I will go into my second tier if you will of protection and that is melanocyte production. So one of the unique things about osmosis approach to hyperpigmentation is not only are we using some of the world's most proven tyrosinase inhibitors and I refuse to use hydroquinone and I'll explain why in a moment um, but we're using them in liposome coated form so that they deliver down to the basal layer which is where they have to get to. Remember even tyrosinase inhibitors have a 2% absorption rate so if you don't get adequate penetration you could use let's say as an example, let's say you use 10% hydroquinone which no one would really recommend but some doctors still do but let's say you use 10% hydroquinone in the skin very little of that is actually penetrating down to the basal layer. So we know that the skin's pretty sensitive to tyrosinase inhibitors to begin with. So we liposome coat our nine tyrosinase inhibitors, and I go into detail on those in the uh, product description uh, that you'll find on our Enlighten product. Um, but each of those nine tyrosinase inhibitors has a different, different mechanism of action. So my first thought process was this. We've seen research that shows that an individual ingredient can be applied to the skin, a single ingredient, and that ingredient over a period of a week to two weeks becomes dismantled or no longer effective in the skin. Kojic acid is a classic example of this. In a petri dish or in on pig skin or wherever else it's been tested, kojic acid is a 
moderately good uh, tyrosinase inhibitor. But when it's applied to the skin, after about two weeks, the skin seems to figure out what's going on there and it works around it. Remember, when we are inhibiting the tyrosinase enzyme to reduce pigmentation production, we are actually working against the skin. So whenever you work against the skin, it tries to figure out a way around what's happening. It considers it a foreign body, something that it does not want. So it figured out a way, in the, terms of, in the instance of kojic acid, to work around it. So now you have many ingredients that probably have that potential. That's why I don't believe any one single ingredient is a good approach to treating hyperpigmentation. Hence, nine tyrosinase inhibitors. Some of them proven to be as strong as hydroquinone as you'll hear about in the ingredient discussions. But basically, this is a powerful mixture of tyrosinase inhibitors. The second aspect of this, however, is long-term skin health. And this is, again, the forgotten aspect of every treatment protocol, whether it be rosacea, for acne, for photo damage. People aren't thinking about how to make the skin healthier over the long term. And what helps with hyperpigmentation is when you make the skin healthier over the long term. In other words, if we use 1,3-beta-glucan to pull the... Uh, scar tissue out of that area, or we're using niacinamide or retinaldehyde to increase the vascular supply to that area, now all of a sudden it's getting more antioxidants. The melanocyte isn't feeling the need to produce pigment at the same rate that it was before. And so we inhibit the tyrosinase enzyme, which will shut down that melanocyte overactivity, and then we remodel the dermis and the epidermal junction in order to create a long-term approach to treating hyperpigmentation we think this is very effective. The second aspect, of course, of hyperpigmentation is melasma. Melasma is becoming a epidemic, an, epi an epidemic, if you will, because most women are going on birth control pills not knowing that one out of every three women on birth control pills will develop melasma. Now, I believe melasma is uh, where hyperpigmentation in general is a dermal epidermal junction problem. Melasma is a systemic problem. And we know that hormones, um, either increased levels of hormones through pregnancy or uh, a hormone um, increases through other medications, including, uh, but not limited to, birth control pills, will create a melasma reaction. My personal belief is this stems from some sort of a uh, yeast molecule that either overgrows in the colon or somewhere else in the body that results in the production of pigmentation in the skin. Now, how do we treat that? Well, that's a whole separate discussion, and, and it's actually quite difficult to treat. But on the flip side, how do we address it in the skin? We well, have to do it in a holistic manner. Now, understand for a second why I don't like some of the more harsh um, hyperpigmentation ingredients that have been used in the past. For example, azulaic acid. Consider that to be just a little too traumatic to the skin. It doesn't have any receptors it's working on. It interferes. Um, with the epidermal barrier, which is going to increase the number of free radicals in your skin. Then there's hydroquinone, the odds-on favorite of every dermatologist. What's wrong with hydroquinone? Well, besides creating some skin conditions um, with long-term use that are certainly uh, scary, some, some permanent changes in the pigmentation in the skin that can occur with uh, chronic use of hydroquinone, it's inflammatory in general. It's toxic to the skin. And what happens when you create inflammation in the skin? You increase melanin production. So that you see, hydroquinone fights against itself. That's why so many people with hydroquinone um, serums tend to get rebound hyperpigmentation. Um, and, and it's toxic. I mean, you know, it's funny to me that a doctor will say, well, it's not really toxic, but don't use it when you're pregnant. And um, yes, it is inflammatory. And oh, we know it's toxic to the melanocyte. And, you know, all the different things that, that are out there about the ingredient. The bottom line for me is, fine, if you want to use hydroquinone, you take a risk of permanent pigmentation changes in your skin, number one, and this is proven by research. Number two, you know that it's not healthy in your body, so whatever minimal amount gets into your system, consider it a, a toxic invasion, because we know that hydroquinone is not healthy for the system. It's certainly not something we would want to take as an oral supplement or inject into our body, and so for that reason, putting it into something that absorbs into the skin uh, doesn't make sense to me either. But the most important thing to address here is long-term skin health. And I think that's what we do very effectively with the hyperpigmentation serum that we use, which is called Enlighten. The results have been fantastic, and we hope you give it a try.